Good evening, everyone. My name is Cynthia Demise, and I am the, uh, the project managing consultant for the new Pride Agenda. We thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we have not been on for the past two weeks, which have been in many ways really remarkable. Um, we thank Black Lives Matter and many other organizations that have uh, mounted uh, peaceful protests throughout this country to raise issues of police brutality and race. And we are happy to um, move up the presentation this evening to have that very discussion. Um, we have a shout out also to Supreme Court, stunningly uh, made the correct civil rights decision. Thank you all the advocates, ACLU, all of all that have worked with the courts to do make it, recognize our citizenship and our rights to a fair workplace. Um, New Pride Agenda started just over a year ago. We want to uh, focus on the most underserved of our LGBTQ plus communities. We are doing education and uh, civic engagement and advocacy. In regard to advocacy, we're working with colleagues on a number of bills in Albany, we are New York State, um, in, our, in our breath and including walking while trans, which did not get included in the police reform package, but uh, is being advocated to uh, come to a positive uh, a conclusion this session. Jared, others are very deeply involved in that. Um, we are also at the Pride Agenda trying to encourage the City Council and Speaker Corey Johnson to support uh, uh, funding for uh, better implementation of gender uh, and provide, uh, allow funding to do more training in the community. On the education front, as soon as COVID started, we had hoped to do some uh, work in community, but immediately pivoted to virtual town halls, which we do twice a month. Um, on wellness, on mental health, on having good sex life, sex workers. Two weeks from now, we'll focus on immigration, all with incredible panels and talent that um, we're, we're, we're honored to present. Um, also in the area of, uh, of uh, civic engagement, just to let you know, uh, we have been working for a year with Columbia University on a LGBTQ survey that will be sent to, to tens of thousands of people next week in New York City. We wanna hear your opinion about what issues you care about, LGBTQ community. We wanna hear how you feel about whether electeds are being responsive. Um, and uh, we wanna create a, a, a new base for information. So we are responsive to what your interests are. Um, the, uh, it's, it'll be an exciting moment. And then one more thing, we'll just next week begin to announce a search for an executive director for the new Pride Agenda, uh, which we hope to bring on, me too, <laughs> me too, uh, uh, early fall. Um, and uh, here we have wonderful potential candidates on this panel and many others. So we encourage you to watch for that and um, uh, um, submit your name if you're interested in taking on what we hope to be a continuing cutting edge work from the ground up advocacy network. Um, uh, so thank you for joining us. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ahmed Mohammed to begin to talk a little bit about logistics. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for this important discussion. Like she mentioned, my name is Ahmed Mohammed, and I'm a community organizer with the New Pride Agenda. We've been working a lot to provide this content for you tonight. I know the world is reeling and so this is an important moment for us to discuss next steps and be tactical about making sure the movement persists. Before I pass it off to Jason who's going to talk a bit about the theme for tonight and what you guys should expect, I'm going to go over logistics but I also want to talk a little bit about what took to develop this town hall. We've all as panelists um, been having conversations leading up to this moment and they've been very engaging um, and at certain points, they have also been points of disagreement. And so tonight we also might see a little bit of that, a little bit of disagreement. And I just want everyone to know that disagreement should be perceived as something positive, where you're trying to unite movements here. And so there are multiple movements within movements and natural tensions points that exist. And so part of the honest work is to talk about those disagreements and internalizing them as things that are positive. Um, 
And so I'll go over logistics real quick. At the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. Um, please feel free to engage with us. We want this to be as interactive as possible. So any questions that you might have, I'll be sourcing to the panelists and myself. Um, we also recommend you keep your screen in gallery view. That's the Brady Bunch style. Um, just so you can see all the faces at the same time, um, see how people are reacting to other comments. And we're gonna hope to have this around Robin style. So you hear from multiple voices about multiple topics. Um, and let me know if you have run into any logistical problems. I'll be trying to moderate this, but also keeping on multiple hats with regards to sourcing questions and dealing with technical issues. Um, but before I pass it off, yes, thank you for joining us. I'm excited. And without further ado, I'm passing off to Jason Walker. Hello, everyone. My name is Jason Lamar Walker. I use all pronouns. Um, I am super excited for this panel. Um, it comes at a critical moment, right? A moment where um, we're talking about Black Lives Matter, a moment uh, where it's Pride Month, right? Uh, it's, it's a moment where we can talk um, uh, freely and openly about the intersection between queer liberation work and Black liberation work, um, and really connect and conjoin those movements. Um, so I'm super excited to have some brilliant leaders, activists, um, movement organizers and builders who are working to build a better world who are gonna be here for this discussion today. Um, so with no further ado, I'm just going to pass it over to our panelists so that they can introduce themselves and then we'll hop right into the discussion. So first, we're going to go to Musafa. Hi, folks. My name is Mustafa Sullivan. I'm the executive director of Fierce. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. For those who don't know, Fierce is a 20-year-old organization. Um, that was started by black and brown, uh, queer and trans New Yorkers who were fighting against police violence and gentrification. Now as an organization, we are in the Bronx and we're fighting against police violence and gentrification in the Bronx. And we also are particularly taking a stand against homelessness of our uh, queer and trans young people who often are pushed out of their families of origin because of abuse and vi or violence. Or violence find in the New York schools. Um, I will leave it at that because I know we have a lot to talk about. Thank you. Jared? Um, hey all, my name is Jared Trujillo. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, or his, or whatever is respectful. Uh, I'm the president of the Association of Legal Aid Attorneys. It's a union of about 2,000 legal workers that uh, do a lot of the work to uplift uh, low-income New Yorkers. And I'm also a steering committee member of Decrim NY. Um, it is a collaboration of about 30 different community organizations uh, that exist to decriminalize, decarcerate, and destigmatize the sex trades, uh, the consensual adult sex trades in New York. So thank you for having me. Thank you. And finally, last, but definitely the greatest, <laughs> Lala. Hello, everyone. I am Lala Zanel. My pronouns are Goddess Queen Sister and um, she, her, hers. Um, happy Pride Month. And so I'm happy to be, you know, one of the girls here, one of the fierce, leading fierce to trans women of color on this panel with a group of um, men of color. And so that's just really powerful to me to have this conversation. Um, I work at the ACLU where I do, I am the trans justice campaign manager where I do work impacts it um, around our trans communities with different affiliates across the ACLU spectrum around decriminalization of sex work, ID documents for trans and non-conforming folks, conditions of incarceration, which is very important right now, and trans kids in sports. And so those are the things that I work on as well as working with um, other departments within the organization internally and trying to really bring um, trans issues and people of color leadership within the institution. So. I'm really excited about that work. Uh, so um, formerly, I was lead organizer of the New York City um, Anti-Violence Project, where I did a lot of their uh, organizing work and has been very um, momentum in that and getting trans murders actually more visible on a national level, as well as um, being a part of community land for police reform. So I'm here, and I'm excited for the conversation today. Thanks, Lala. Um, so, as you all know, it, it is Pride Month, right? Um, and last year, New York celebrated World Pride, well, the world celebrated, right? World Pride in New York City 
commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. Um, Lala, can you talk a little bit more about the history of Stonewall? And, and yeah, just, I think it's a great place to start our conversation there. Oh, you're on mute. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so for me, it's very, um, I think everything happens for a reason. And I always believe that history does repeat itself. And so it's um, very, um, the irony of right now, we're in the middle of Pride Month where we're dealing with policing, where trans women of color and other people of color decided to riot back against the police violence that they were receiving in the West Village due to the policing of homophobia and transphobia and um, the three articles of clothing law. So they got tired of it, they fought back, they fought the police for a few days and just really rioted in a time where you wouldn't think about um, the world being so receptive of us rebelling in that way. And so to have us right now and Black folks in the same moment doing the same thing, and that has just been a build up of um, people of color tired of these systems. And so while we're trying to collectively fight against police brutality against our Black men, it's also a time and a moment for Black leaders to be very strategic, to also uplift all the Black lives that we have lost in this moment and come up with strategic um, solutions to that. So this whole month, just, you know, because a lot of people are upset because we can't do pride events or things that we normally conventionally do, I think that trans and non-conforming folks, and particularly folks of color, have pride every day. So every day it's a rebellion. Every day we leave these streets, we know that we're impacted by the color of our skin and our identity. And so for us, it's like Stonewall every day. And so our folks who have said that they are woke, which is amazing, but what are you gonna do with that energy? What comes in? And hopefully later on today, we'll get more into the meeting maybe you ready around that. I'm excited for that conversation. Lala, can you talk a little bit more about the three article of clothing law? I'm just okay, sure. So yeah. back then, if you got caught with more than three articles of clothing of the opposite gender, so if you were a male, um, identified it as cisgender male, but you were presenting as trans, you had on three articles of clothing, um, a female clothing, you would go to jail, folks were sent to mental asylums a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it was against the law and vice versa for women too. And so that's what the rebellion had started from. They were tired of fighting with the police. They were tired of us just having to continually fight for space. And so they went into the Stonewall Inn where they weren't supposed to be in there. The cops came in, you know, the, the gays being who they are, you know, the gays dance with the lesbians, the lesbians dance with them. And they let the trans folks defend for themselves. And they threw a brick and decided to fight back. And that is why we celebrate Pride. That's where the liberation that came from. So I think that's very important. I think it's very important for folks who are trans you're not conforming, who are always looking for that possibility model or that piece of hope. In 1969, we were already rebelling against um, these systems. And a lot of us don't even know about Stonewall until today. I know I didn't know about Stonewall until mm -hmm. so I moved to New York City. And so like a lot of us have already been doing these kind of organizing in our own lives every day, not knowing what to call it and not knowing that there was a historical context to what we um, do today, which is organizing and rebellion against the system. Yeah. So last year was the um, the 50th anniversary of the riots. And this year is the 50th anniversary of the, the march, the first Pride March. Is that correct? Yes, cool. correct. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Mustafa, let's let's talk a little bit about like the oh well first, does anyone have anything to add to that that history, that narrative? Cool. Mustafa, um, you being an organizer rooting in Black Lives Matter. Um, in Black liberation work in New York City. Can you talk a little bit about the history of uh, of work in New York City, specifically around police violence? Well, I think, you know, a lot of people have seen, um, you know, Black Lives Matter grow into a larger national movement on the heels of Trayvon Martin's uh, uh, death, right? On the heels of George, Martin, George Zimmerman's acquittal. In New York and in many places, including in Florida, there were always folks who were fighting against police violence. One of the main things that you ever saw Black Panthers do, um, specifically to even go back to them, right, they were fighting against police violence. The Young Lords in New York um, were notorious for fighting off, uh, fighting off police in their own communities. And in fact, just bringing a connection to the movement, Sylvia Rivera was in the Young Lords and often talked about the violence that trans women and particularly women were encountering, particularly in the movement in the Young Lords and in other different um, places like the Black Panthers and all those different things. 
So I think, you know, I just want to say that because I think that there's a lot of people confused about the history of movement and often, um, often feel like, oh, folks are now just talking about queer folks being erased, now just talking about Black trans women being erased. When that was happening in the civil rights movement that was happening in our movements from, you know, going back to the 1920s, queer folks and trans folks were fighting, radical queer folks and trans folks were always fighting for Black lives. And so when we talk about the Black Lives Matter movement, I think it's important to bring it into that, that context, right? That Black liberation movement has always been fighting and has always been fighting, um, in some ways, enemies on all sides, right? Folks in the community who don't want us to speak, who don't want us to take up space, and also at the same time, systemic violence from the police and from white supremacist forces, right? A lot of what's happening right now is very similar, right? Except for the fact that we, as a community, have forgotten a lot of that history. And we've forgotten that um, the police have never been on our side. And yes, people have tried community-based policing before. And people have tried, as we've seen you know, at Pride, luckily last year, and we've started more at Fierce, and have always had a history of going against like the corporate Pride that sort of has all the police barriers and rainbow police cars and all these different things. Um, I forgot the question that you asked me, but the point that I'm trying to make um, is that New York has a rich history of fighting against police violence and knowing that community-based police and all these other things that people are trying to, to, to talk about don't work. Yeah. Um, I have kind of like two follow-up questions. One, uh, centered around the erasure. I know a few years ago there was a film about Stonewall and the community was in an uproar because the person that threw the brick was depicted in the it's film. White Wall. <laughs> I never saw it. It was, it, was, it was a very strange whitewashing. But the truth of the matter is, some of your favorite movies about the AIDS epidemic, whitewashed. Some of your favorite stories about the civil, civil rights movement, race, erase queer and trans folks from those narratives. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different things that, you know, like there's a lot of different ways that we've been erased from history and now's the time for us not to be doing that and not to mm -hmm. allow us to, it to be done, right? You know, mm -hmm. if you've ever been at any meetings, you know, in the Bronx, for example, there are plenty of people who know the real history of the Bronx and who are not willing mm -hmm. to allow any elected official to sort of jump up and say, I'm supporting police brutality, right? You've seen a lot mm -hmm. of elected officials from Uptown specifically, I'm not gonna name names, because you all know exactly who they are, um, have jumped up and talked about police brutality all of a sudden, as if they were always fighting against it, right? Mm -hmm. So there we are. And now we're at this moment where people are gonna really have to decide whose side they're on. And also that people remember, people remember the history. People remember if they've seen you take money from you know, the Police Benevolence Union, for example, the Police Benevolence Association. People remember, uh, and more people in, in, our, in our community need to stop forgetting that just because someone says they're LGBTQ doesn't mean they love Black people. The Supreme Court said it. The Supreme Court just said it. As much as we can, we can be happy and we can, we can live off of the joy of the Supreme Court changing uh, discrimination to our community, we also know that that same Supreme Court said that police can kill that they have qualified immunity, and that's fine. Thank you both Mustafa and Lala for like laying down the historical framework and grounding this conversation. Jared, I wanna turn to you and kind of pivot a bit to the current, if you could describe like the current state of play in the policy world regarding what it means to defund the police, reimagine what the relationship between community and safety looks like. I know that this is a big abstract question, but just given your knowledge of where policy is at right now and the realm of like change that you think um, is most immediate and then long-term possible given where, where we're at. So uh, something that I, I think was really interesting that Mustafa just said is that there is a really long history of between uh, black, uh, queer, and trans folks of, of fighting against the police. Unfortunately, as a society, um, policy-wise, 
there really isn't that long of a history as far as people actually listening to those voices, as far as people actually listening to black and brown voices uh, tell them that the police are an oppressive force. Um, the police, like in year after year, um, police are always recognized as one of the top three most trusted professions in the world. Um, I became a public defender in 2014, the year that Eric Garner died. The year that I became a public defender, NYPD's budget was $4.6 billion a year. Six years later, it's $6 billion a year. That means in those six years of us seeing videos of them brutalizing black and brown folks, of us hearing the stories of so many black and brown folks and the, the interactions that they're having with police, um, and, and not just death, but I mean just planning drugs on people, uh, beating up teenagers, all these stories that we've been hearing during all this time. And what do we do? We increase their budgets. So uh, something that's really exciting about this, move, about this moment uh, within the movement, um, and it's terrible that it took Lelim Palagko Stravaganza's death to make this happen. And it took, um, uh, uh, it took George Floyd's death to make this happen. But people are finally starting to see what black and brown folks, and especially black and brown queer and trans folks, have been telling them for years, is that the police are not your friends. Um, we could talk about police reform all day, but at the end of the day, it, it's not an issue of the police needing to be changed. It's the issue that police are, are just too omnipresent within our communities. And police are just, police will never be our friends. And we were, will never be safe as long as our communities are over-policed. The good thing is that there is a lot of movement going on right now. Um, defund the police, some people call it a toxic term. The pe it's interesting, the people that I see call it a toxic term. I've never seen them in like police accountability movements, um, but whatever. Um, but you know, defund the police, it means a lot of different things and it, and it, and it matters, it means more um, than just you know, cutting a billion dollars uh, this year from the NYPD. What else does it mean? Well, it means reducing the interactions that people have uh, with police officers. So something that was mentioned uh, very briefly, the walking while trans bill, um, it would uh, repeal penal law 24037, loitering for the purpose of prostitution. Uh, this is a constitutional du constitutionally dubious law that's been on the books since 1976. And in 1976, it was unconstitutional. And in 2020, it's unconstitutional. What this law does is it enables police officers to walk up to black trans women um, and walk up to Latina trans women um, and really just to walk up to any woman of color that they want to walk up to for merely having the audacity to exist in a public space and charge that person with this crime that has really pernicious immigration consequences um, it has terrible employment consequences, and it really impacts your housing. If you get three of these, uh, three of these convictions or violations, it could really um, um, impact your ability to get public housing. Uh, they walk up to these people for how they're dressed, uh, because they're maybe standing on the corner waiting for a cab or a train, or they're waiting for a friend to come out of the club so they can walk together in numbers, because Black uh, trans existence is, is, is still brutalized. Um, a police officer within the NYPD admitted under deposition. I mean, at least they usually have like, they at least usually just lie to us. But he admitted in a deposition that he was looking for women with Adam's apples when determining who to target under this statute. So this is again, been on the books since, I can rant about that one all day, so stop me um, if I am. But um, that's, that law has been on the books since 1976. And in 2020, we're finally seeing movement to do something about, uh, about that statute that's really targeting, uh, targeting our people. But even statutes that don't specifically mention black and brown, uh, uh, queer and trans folks, they still impact our communities. Uh, the entire criminal legal system, it, it more adversely impacts our communities than anyone else. 47% of black trans women are incarcerated at some time, at some point in their lives. So we really do need to think about the crim criminal legal reforms in a holistic way. And it's something that I do think that New York is starting to do. And also when we think about criminal legal reforms, we have to realize like what, what is the criminal legal system? You know, when I was a public defender, um, I would talk to people about what happens if you take this plea, what happens if we go to trial and lose, what could happen with your case. But 
a lot of that conversation is beyond just their case. So the criminal legal system is emphatically tied to immigration because uh, immigration can have uh, some of the most, the most pernicious consequences uh, within the criminal legal system. Um, it's tied to employment. Uh, for so many of our people that already experience so many barriers to, to, to jobs and employment, that uh, having a criminal conviction or even a violation can even exacerbate that. Um, it, it's tied to the foster care system. The best way to determine if someone is going to end up in uh, the criminal legal system is if they're in the juvenile legal system. And the best determinant for that is unfortunately if they're in the foster care system and how that is so dangerous and violent for our people. So. Um, and to summarize, because I don't, I don't want to rant all night about this, um, but historically, communities have just not paid attention to us when we said that police presence is violence. They're starting to, and there's a long way to go. And I really hope, I know that everyone on this panel is down for the fight, and I really hope that the people that are listening to this panel really join us um, in, in really trying to liberate our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. That was very poignant. I think it's what strikes me about what you're just saying and kind of I learned something new from Lala about the three articles of clothing sort of statue um, when you're talking about the history and walking while trans seems just like another iteration of that, right? Like criminalizing someone based on their appearance, regardless of what they're doing just because of who they are and how they look. And so it's it's insane how we're kind of still fighting in a way, the same fight, but a different iteration of it. One that's um, more conniving, if you will, the fact that you it's like very subtle and, it, and stuff like that. Um, I think this is the next question is something for the audience or not the audience, excuse me, all of the panelists, whoever is interested in responding, hopefully we hear a few answers. When we're talking about defunding the police and reform, there's also like the necessary coupling of investing. Not, I was gonna say reinvesting, but we kind of never invested in our community in the way that it deserves. And so I don't know if you guys wanna to speak to this at all, if anyone can talk to what sort of, we know this on this panel, and some of us have been doing this work, but just so we can do the work of educating, what sort of ways can we, reimagine the investments that we make at the city level at the state level for these marginalized communities um and re re resourcing the funds that we usually give to police departments i mean well i think we already have i think we are doing it now i think we've been doing it every since we got into this pandemic i felt like the community has come up with so many solutions on their own that when this is over with we need to push on those systems that this needs to continue so we've been having folks bail out folks left and right with lower and offenses and stalling our folks out. We have been having folks doing work with DAs to get GAs not to prosecute lower end offenses or prosecuting sex working charges. Just, you know, around the basis of just like health, also the well-being of folks that are in halfway houses and in shelters. And so I think that we've created um, community-based solutions as well as community raising money to bail people out and to house people and get people food and essentials and things of that nature. And so I think we've proven to ourselves that when something like this happens, we do come together and we know how to organize and come up with the solutions and plans without the system. It's like now that when it's over with to continue that. Don't think that, oh, that only happened for that period because of the pandemic, but also to believe that, no, this can happen every day. This is not, you made it in that moment, you can continue it as a way to um, continue community-based um, solutions. I have a um, just a quick follow up question to to this point around like um, what does it look like in the new world, right? So to speak of policing, right? Um, it was interesting to see what's happening at Minneapolis as kind of like the the guiding light uh, as to like what do we do? And a black trans woman who ran for who is a city council member, Andrea Jenkins, is talking about shifting into a public health um, model. Um, uh, talking about like COVID-19 and racism through a public health lens. Can you talk a little bit more about that and, and a little bit around, there's a conversation about divesting from police, but what should we invest in to help ensure that our communities are healthy? Um, uh, so yeah, I just want to kind of like open up that piece. I mean, I think one big part of it is economics, right? People are starving already due to this pandemic, right? Homeless folks were pushed all over the city 
and when we're barely given any place to live safe from pandemic, right? And there's still people living in this city right now and all over this country in the streets right now. So when we talk about what the pandemic is, when we think about how racism showed up to rear America's, America's truth that was already happening, we have to look back at places where we already were neglecting. So that's homeless folks. That's all the people in prison. Let's be clear. People, people like us, people, many of the folks who are, who are on this panel I know, we're also, we also need to look at our prisons, right? There's all types of black folks locked up who are dying in prison that we have forgotten about. But yet we're talking about defunding the police. We also need to defund the prisons. And we need to start thinking about what is it that creates violence in community? Starvation, lack of education. What's the quality of the schools right now, right? When, when um, you know, not, not to bring us back to, to violence within our community, but one of the folks that several folks know that we supported was Abel Sedeno, a young person who was bullied in his own school in the Bronx. Mm. And, the, and the DA, the same DA that basically said that Abel Sedeno is a murderer is also the same DA that said Leilene Polanco um, should have died in prison. That's the same DA. That's the same court system, right? So when we talk about the defunding the police, know that many of us are talking about a whole system of violence that's landing on our bodies, that's landing on all of us all the time, constantly. And then to compound things worse, we're fighting and killing amongst each other. And then we also know attacks on white supremacist people that's happening right now as we speak. So there's so many different parts that, have, that this defund police argument has opened. But I say that we really need to look at all the things that we've already neglected in our community um, that, that many of us have been fighting for for years and years and years. Yeah. Anyone else? Have, uh, yes. Yeah, uh, just real quick. Um, the things that, because Jason, you asked, like, what should we be funding when we're defunding the police? We should look at the things that we decided to defund first before we decided to defund the police. So, um, you know, it's not like getting to this defund the police framework is something that was created overnight. Before, um, before all the outrage happened, the first budget item that people are really up, up in arms about was the defunding of the summer youth employment program, which employs a whole bunch, it employs about 75,000 kids in the city every year. Um, their majority, a majority of them are black or brown. Um, a lot of them are low income and it creates a lot of priorities for placement uh, within the program for people that are say living in NYCHA or that are court involved or involved in the, the foster care system and really kids that just um, need it uh, because of the different systems of oppression that they have to deal with every day. That program was funded with no notice, not even an email to the program participants. I haven't been a juvenile defense attorney since 2017, but I still keep in contact with some of my old clients. It is ridiculous and disgusting that my clients had to find out that this program was defunded from a lawyer that they haven't even like had regular contact with in three years. Um, but meanwhile, while we were cutting $150 million for that program, we were only talking about cutting like $24 million from the police at the time, which is like 0.39% 39 of their budget. So um, like, look at the programs we were thinking of cutting. We were thinking of cutting that. We were, there was a, a, um, um, a program for runaway and homeless LGBTQ youth, a mm -hmm. specific jobs program for them. Only $2.7 million um, over four years. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to cut that uh, like immediately. Always look at immigration programs because those are usually first on the chopping block because they can't vote. So who cares about them, right? Um, as a society. Um, the fact that uh, youth programs in general were cut about 40% when we couldn't even cut the police by 0.4%. So we were talking about reinvesting, like look at the places that we were cut, look at the people that were disposable in the first round um, of the mayor's executive budget. And really that's where we should be investing money. And, and finally, um, just to like, I love being here in this space with like Lala and Mustafa, because like the entire time they're talking, I'm just like, yes. <laughs> but um, you know, but you think about why do we have like, why are people over police now? Why um, are people in the criminal legal system now? It's two reasons, racism and poverty. 
So when you're thinking about things to invest in, when we divest from police, there are things that should alleviate racism and poverty. So uh, another quick follow-up. What I've been hearing from the ground is there's kind of like three um, ways or essentially that we talk about like um, this new system, right? There's a, a, a reform movement, like folks are talking about like, hey, how do we reform policing? There's also a divest, right, or defund movement. And then there's also the abolition. I want to hear from each of you all where you all stand and why. <laughs> Hot seat. <laughs> so the way I would analogize reforming the police, when I was 20 years old, I was in love with this guy. And like, he would always tell me like, once this happens, I'll love you back. So it was just like, at first it was just like, oh, let me get an apartment. And then it was just like, oh, let me get a job. And then it was just like, oh, let you, let you get a little bit older. And like, there was like always these, these, these metrics that I could just never meet until six months later, I'm just like, oh, this man is never gonna love me. And we gotta realize like, that's how it is with police and police reform. We can ask them to do better. We can give them body cameras. We can do, we can like put all these things in place for the police to do better, but they will never love black and brown people. And that's just the world that we live in. So where am I? I'm an abolitionist. When I say defund the police, like in my heart, I mean like get rid of all of them um, and have more community-based solutions for this. Also, however, defund the police, it's a term of art, a billion dollars, only 15% only of their budget, but it's a start. Oh my, like really we're gonna have this conversation now. <laughs> um, breaking it down the way that she broke it down, I mean, y'all should already know where I'm at anyway, so that should not just be a question. But the way you broke it down, I think that that is why I've always been an, an abolitionist. Like how much we, we reform, we reform, we, like this is reform. Nothing ever changes, we've reformed. Ain't nobody stopped dying, ain't nobody, it's people still, more people arrested than ever. We defund it, we defund it, <laughs> we defund it. Like I'm just to like, no, just, it's out of there. I feel like what, what's gonna happen? What, what could possibly happen? It's worse now, so like just let the whole thing go and we'll fix it from there, from the ground up, from community on up. That's just where I'm at with it, <laughs> just to get, to it. Yeah, that's, I feel like that's the next wave. Just go ahead and do it. We're already in the streets anyway. Just go ahead and just go on and abolish it. And we would just fix it from there and make models on how it works. Trial and error. Like, what, what more is going to happen? Like, it's already messed up and they're messing it up. So I don't get it. Um, I agree with everything that Lala said. The only thing I want to add is that, and I and I I would I know Lala, so I would assume that you also agree with this. This is about colonization, and if we're gonna really talk about abolition, what we're really talking about is all of this system is made up. What we think is good and crime that's made up. It's made up to benefit a system that has has white folks in the front, that has men in the front regardless of who they are and how they defend themselves, how they talk to themselves, whatever that is. And then it also is a system that obviously then puts many people who are poor underneath the boot of all of that, right? So if you want to be a really good Black person, go hang out with a celebrity, right? You should be a celebrity. Things that all of our favorite celebrities say. So I'm also an anti-celebrity person. I mean, I love all of you. Please send us whatever you can. But I'm not listening to you. I'm listening to people on the ground, in my community. And, I, and I'm sick of us often, we're asking questions of, well, what does this celebrity think? What does this person think? When we're not talking about this stuff in our own neighborhoods. We're not honestly saying, why do you think we should abolish police? Many people are afraid of abolishing police because they think they have some safety. And I'm not saying this as like people, I'm saying people in my own family do not believe in abolishing the police. And yet I persist. I have that conversation, not just when it comes to reform and not just when it comes to policies, and I'm involved in those conversations, but I also talk, what does it really mean? What's the cop in our head? What's the part of us that says, you know what? 
I'm judging those young people. For example, if you're in New York or almost anywhere in the world, there's all these fireworks going off, right? Some would say, and I actually think that there's been some um, recent proof in New York that the fire department is doing it, but I'm not going to spread any gossip about why other people would, you know, make fireworks go off at this particular moment. Let's just say, let's accept that as people in our community. And I think that it's fine, even though I don't like fireworks. We don't talk to the people who like fireworks in our community. We judge. We pick up the phone and we call the police. That's why they exist. We have to figure out how we stop calling the police and instead we call each other and we say, you know what? Do I know the person on the corner that's doing fireworks and I get them to stop? Do I know the person who's in a domestic violence situation and how do I intervene and get them safety? How do I get everyone healed? We don't do enough of that. And we do a lot of, let's go let this elected official do it. Let's go let this law do it. We've got to do it on our own. And that's what I believe. That's what I believe, that if we're going to really heal our community, then we have to start with each other and we have to work with each other in ways that, that show our, our contradictions and struggle with each other in real, in real conversations. I'm a real person. I'm not fierce, you know? Yeah, I'm fierce, but I'm not the organization. I'm a person first, if that makes sense. I just have one additional follow-up and then I'm going to pass it over to Ahmed. Because you talked about a word that like we've been seeing throughout the movement, like colonization, right? Like folks all over the, the world essentially have been uprising and getting rid of kind of like our colonial past and so to speak. Can we talk a little bit about like how gentrification plays a role in the policing of communities? Because um, I think like we've, we've seen that even in the village, right? Like the village in particular, the gentrification that happened in the village over police black queer kids where ballrooms started on the piers, you know? So let's, I, I want to kind of like open up that conversation and talk about gentrification in, in a way um, to open up like, like how does that add or contribute to um, the over policing of, of, of blackness and queerness? I think, it, I mean, it, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I want to hear you. I mean, I don't think that, you know, I think that that's something else, again, that people are building a layer to make another excuse. Like, it's, and we call it gentrification. So it's like this new thing, like, oh my gosh, the gentrifiers have done this. No, we have participated as well. And so it's about calling it what it is. It's coming into somewhere that you see as something that is wealth or that you can make money at. And it's funny that pretty much every, queer pocket where that has become historical areas, that is where they want to come in and make it a tourist attraction and push people out and then police folks that are, are on the street and try to like make it something that it was never designed to be in the, in the ideology of this is making it better. Instead of like Masasa said, talking to the folks that frequent those communities that live there, what do they want? And I think that continues to happen and then folks who live there who are able to stay there, who don't get pushed out, then they in, in turn believe that, oh, this is like so much better because the, I have a Whole Foods on the corner. I have all these immunities that are just immunity, um, putting Band-Aids on their racism because this, then when you start going in the Whole Foods, then your police, like what you're doing in the Whole Foods and you're living in certain buildings, policing of, do you really stay here or how do you afford to live here? And so once they create it, they just show up in the ways that they always do when they call it gentrification. They call it, I'm trying to learn, um, like all these things, I'm an ally, like all these things that they get to hide behind that when you get to talk to them about, it's very much, there's no checks and balances. There has been a loss of checks and balances where us as Black folks, they're able to check off these things on how we're supposed to respond to everything, how we're supposed to show up, all these things that none of us can fit into that have been going on before we got here. And then they can just show up and say, well, we need more trainings and it's okay. No one says, no, we tired of the damn trainings. <laughs> this is what's gonna happen next. We don't do that. We pacify them. <laughs> we go to the system and give them, let them do trainings and say they're learning. And so us as leaders and us as people of color have to stop doing that and actually saying, no, this is what the next step is. <laughs> and stop calling them through their racism and, and letting them feel uncomfortable because it should feel uncomfortable. All great points. Um, I'm just sitting here learning and listening. Um, and it also reminds me of like 
the long history, um, this I'm just gonna be brief, the long history of policing in this country after um, the enslaved black people in America were finally free, finally free. Um, and that brief period of reconstruction in American history where we kind of like got the closest to our principles of equality for all, obviously not queer people and women, but just on a peer race level, that's kind of the closest we got to it. But then the backlash and the, the, the use of the police as a force to kind of control that progression during reconstruction by the black community, black Americans. And so part of what's, special and feels different about this moment in time is that i don't know it just feels different and I, i'm still trying to process why it feels different but i guess like we could do that as a group and some of the questions i know we've been asked by some of our attendees i'm going to read one out loud and this is just for anyone to pick up on um so with all that's going on in the world is there anything that is different do you think that we will see significant transform transformative changes for black people? What does this mean for social justice and transformative civil rights for all of us, not just blacks, but for all of us who live at or outside of the margins? Um, and so I know it's like kind of like a multi-part question, but, um, and we've been like belaboring a bit of the issue, nibbling around it, but if we could talk explicitly about what feels different about this and how we can hone the difference and like, use it moving forward, I think that would be a good point for this discussion. Well, one thing I think, and, and this is gonna sound the way it's gonna sound, the, the, the community, uh, uh, community based policing people, the stop the violence people, the black, the only, the people who only believe that as soon as a black person becomes elected, they become on our side people, they're losing. They're losing a lot of ground. And you know, like, I mean, like, just being real, I love black people, but we've got to get over the obsession of the image of Obama. Policies, laws, or giving up. We have to start thinking deeper about what do we really mean when we talk about socialism? And now, you know, all this socialists out there who are going to be like, oh, you know, for example, Bernie Sanders still does not support the defund the police movement. I am not surprised because I do not believe that political leadership can bring us the type of change that we're really talking about. It's much deeper than that. And I also don't think that people who do that type of stuff, I don't think that they intentionally are trying to hurt people, but I know that there's plenty of them who are just doing it for their own ego moving up so that they can prove to themselves that somehow they're a leader for the community when they've forgotten and cut the throats of the people in the community. I know that those people exist also out there, but I'm again, the, the more radical message is starting to be heard. And it's coming from people who are not just workers, right? Not just people who are in union. That's including me are following people who are, guess what, learning how to organize tomorrow because they're fed up and they decided to jump into the movement. And so we should honor them. We should honor that many of the people who fought New York City's curfew were young people who, yes, do not follow respectability and are not confused about who the looters are. We need to understand that because New York City almost went to sleep. I'm telling you, two weeks ago, I was thinking about how to fight off a whole city that was gonna go to sleep for the whole summer. They still have not explained what that curfew was about. And there were those people who are afraid and those who put their bodies on the line. That is still the case. And we have to understand that sometimes we don't know why those people are putting their bodies on the line, but they're doing it for all of us to be freer, for all of us to be able to, I don't know, go outside in New York after eight o'clock, even during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Crawford. Jared, do you have anything? And then we'll get to Lala. Um, so as far as what makes this movement different, and I think I can also address one of the questions in the chat about police unions. Um, I really think that it, it's really the first time that people have truly looked at how the police are problematic um, as an institution. Um, 
so many other times, like so many other times when you see police do horrific things to black people, people always think of it as, are the general, not people, because I, I think everyone on this panel and a lot of other people certainly don't think this way. But I think general society thinks of it as, this is a bad apple. This is, you know, a rotten cop. This is, you know, uh, this is distinguishable from other police. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many like left wing, quote unquote, podcasts that I listen to um, that still say, oh, well, at least 99% of police are good, but like, this is just a bad one. And it's just like, where they do that at? Like, when? When police were started, uh, the first police forces in the United States were really started to catch runaway slaves. Um, police have been an oppressive force in almost every single, every, not almost, every single movement that oppresses people. So if you think about um, who was during the civil rights movement uh, for black civil rights, who was like sicking dogs on people? Who, were, who was using water hoses on people? Like it wasn't teachers, it wasn't librarians, it was cops. Um, you know, and, and that's just been persistent through history is that police have been the common denominator in every single oppressive movement. And people are finally starting to wake up to that. You know, um, I, and I, I think it's, I hate that the events that had to happen happen, but I think that because they happened in such rapid succession, um, it's making people see it. You, you see with, with Amy Cooper um, in Central Park and you see like how people weaponize police. Uh, you saw obviously what happened with George Floyd. Uh, you see what uh, happened with McDade. Uh, you, see, um, you see just police brutalizing protesters and that's a, finally, finally people are paying attention. And so um, the problem with policing has always been people's idea that police are infallible and you're starting to, to actually see that attacked. Uh, someone in, uh, in the questions asked, how can we support the labor movement and still um, and hold police unions accountable? Um, I'm the president of a union and I do not lose a, a, a wink of sleep in thinking about that because labor movements are about uplifting workers. Labor movements are about uplifting all workers. They would not exist, but for the fact that they need to uplift everyone, trans folks, black folks, disabled folks, everyone. Separately, police unions are white supremacist institutions, and they have been at their core. If you look at a lot of the really oppressive racial policies when it comes to policing, oftentimes it hasn't been the NYPD as the institution that's pushing that. It's the PBA. It's the SBA. Um, SBA, their president, Ed Mullins, sent out an email to all of his membership uh, that, that said, and with the video that said that, Crime is a black entitlement given to black folks by President Obama. That is a person they chose to be their president. How can you not be a white supremacist organization if you keep on electing white supremacists to be your president? The PBA, Pat Lynch, is no better at all whatsoever. Um, and not just, you know, and I, I know that not everyone listening to this is black, but not just for black folks during, um, and they weaponize the media too. Uh, when we were when they were trying to get bail reform uh, rolled back, which is exceptionally racist, and if we, if we have time to get into that, I would love to. Uh, but when they rolled back bail reform, uh, something they did was they, they said that someone spit quote unquote HIV blood um, at a police officer, and that that this police officer was waiting at home, like basically clutching his pearls to see if he was positive or not, as if like PEP doesn't exist, like and also as if like you can like transmit HIV that way. And so it, it, it's just, you know, the police are this, I'm rambling, but the police just are this oppressive force. And I feel that the only way that we change that is for people to recognize it's not bad apples, it's the institution. And the way that you change the institution is to hold them accountable. Um, should police still be in unions? I don't really care. Um, I think that they could still be in unions, but the problem is, is, you know, it's not the fact that they're in unions, it's the fact that our elected leaders let them, the unions do whatever they want. Um, Aaron Fernando uh, did a lot of really great work as far as like exposing all the politicians that are taking uh, police union money, and a lot of them gave it back. Um, a tremendous amount of respect for Aaron, but the, the person that hasn't given it back is Andrew Cuomo, the person that leads a, our governor, the person that leads a lot of our policy decisions, the person that let New York City cities uh, New York City jails and prisons become the epicenter of the COVID-19 epidemic, where they had rates seven to eight times higher than New York City 
of COVID-19 infections. That person gets like $40,000 a year in PBA money. Where's his accountability? That um, is very, very all interesting points. I didn't know that about um, Andrew's work highlighting like the connection between union funding and politicians. Um, this also kind of just reminds me of another sort of question if we're thinking back about how there are multiple movements within this movement, right? And that they're moving parts, if you will. Um, and you square that with the history of both queer liberation and sort of the black freedom fight, you see that there's a difference in like centralization, right? So whether it's like the NAACP having its heyday in the 20th century as like sort of an influence of power, they still have influence. But I guess the question is, how do you see those across multiple planes, and I'll get to those planes, but how do you see these spheres of influence shifting, changing, maybe one becoming less influential than another? I, off the top of my head, I could think of a couple realms that would guide the combo, but in law and court, I'm thinking of Lala and the ACLU and like the work that they do in representing. And we also have organizations on the ground who also have a sphere of influence in another domain. Um, and then like, maybe resources as like a part of a movement if you're thinking tactically you have to know who are leveraging like the resources and the influence in that sense so i guess if i just want to open it up to um mustafa i know that you're unmuted so if you just want to like talk a bit about spheres spheres of influence and how do you think that's been changing across these domains i mean i think one thing that's definitely happening at the moment people are getting back to doing important local work as opposed to just focusing national right and i think that we sh we need to understand the history is the same also in the civil rights movement right it wasn't that people didn't know each other and it wasn't that people actually if you look at like malcolm x um if you look at james baldwin if you look at audrey lord they didn't like the mainstream movement they were often repeatedly saying they are not a part and it's and you know like i i was raised black muslim so i know particularly malcolm x was like i'm not part of what mok is doing over there and repeatedly went went and repeatedly said this to to the to the quote unquote nonviolent movement right there were many people on um, that that we forget that were also supporting what mok was doing and so i just wanted to say that because that's happening right now folks Let's not think that just because everybody who, for example, me, I'm being moved by people in the community you don't know. I'm being motivated and thought of things about like essential workers and how they're being treated by people who are not gonna come up on TV, right? Mm -hmm. So when we talk about movement, we're really talking about a whole set of people that names that we know and names that we don't know. And I think it's really important because we have to acknowledge that many of the people who do the fighting, particularly at night, we don't know their names and they also will be forgotten in the legal system. So we have to remember that with all the protests going on, check on what happens to the protesters after. Are they okay after? Many of them are young. Many of them are young people. This is the first time they saw police attack them. Many of them are people who have just first seen, there's little kids, and I said this before and I'll say it again, there are little kids right now who are terrified because they're four years old and they went on the phone and they saw police violence. Little kids. So I say that to say, there's never a centralized movement. I don't care what anyone tells you. It's always multiple people acting together, working together. Yes, people know each other, but sometimes we don't know who the next, you know, uh, uh, Sylvia Rivera is or who the next Huey P. P. Uh, Newton is because they're yet to be born or they just started, they just joined. So let's not forget that that's what makes this also very powerful, that there's all types of people who are just like, you know what, I'm, set up, I'm gonna go make a sign, I'm gonna go outside, or I'm gonna use Meetup and start a thing and I'm gonna go outside, or I'm gonna grab my friends. That's powerful. Also, we have wary that there's an organized opposition. White supremacists are organized with the police, with our friend in the, or, or, or the, the orange menace over there. And so at the same time that we're organizing and take care of each other, we have to recognize that they have an intention on multiple levels. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have anything to add? I have a couple of follow-up questions. Cool. 
Um, I have a question about as as we start to talk about movement work and intersectional movement work, and I think I, I one of the the reasons for having this is to share lessons from our movements, right? Um, uh, I think like one of the questions that I ask about like are there lessons to learn um from the movement that was started or initiated let's not say started but the moment that we're in right now so like for me i know that last year there was a big issue in conversation um around pink washing of the movement right like you had the reclaim pride march and the new york city pride march right two marches happening last year at the same time with two different interests. Are there any questions, like, are we seeing a blackwashing, so to speak, with these corporations who are investing in black, uh, investing in black uh, businesses? Like, I'm, I'm just, you know, trying to, you know, intersect movements here and recognize some, like, patterns. Is there a worry or concern about the blackwashing of movements um, uh, as a lesson learned? So I want to open up there to, get you all thoughts on that? And then also, are there other like lessons or things we should be mindful of as we continue our work? Somebody else can go, I'm, still, I'm trying to get it all together. Because this is a good one. I know. Repeat your question, Jason. Sorry. I'm like, I thought I got caught up in like thinking about yes, that. Yes, 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 yes. So the question is that like, you know, last year, Reclaim Pride did a march, right? In New York City, there was two marches. Reclaim Pride March, 40,000 people marched to Central Park. Um, Larry Kramer, um, rest in peace, spoke there. A lot of leading activists who kind of like, um, there was a split in the LGBTQ movement right now, right? Folks who are going against capitalism and saying that our movement was inclusive from the beginning, that we're intersectional identities here, and we want to reclaim that narrative um, uh, do, and, and do that as a protest against the um, New York City march, right? Um, that they say was a, 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 a pink wash, so to speak, right? That there's a pink wash in a corporation, corporations drove in. There was a lot, there was a lot of press on this last year too, right? Um, you saw that starting even in DC, all these folks were doing these um, resistance efforts doing pride for the last two or three years, right? So the question then is, as on the precipice of Juneteenth, right, um, we're starting to see corporations as well like to pitch in and throw down, so to speak, on the liberation of Black folks. Are there things that we should be worried of? Or is that a lesson learned that we should stay vigilant about like, hey, how do corporations help like shape movement? This is something that like I think about a lot as I'm like having conversations with some of I don't want to talk shit about anybody, but <laughs> anyway, as I have conversations with a lot of black people that are like maybe lawyers or doctors or have advanced degrees that like makes them think that they're like maybe that they're above some shit and then like seeing things recently, letting them know, no, you're still black. So um, now, this is something that I think about a lot. Um, I think that we do have to be careful um, when we think about, like, whenever I see, like, someone put Black Lives Matter up, the first thing I think about is, like, what, well, what does that really mean to you? Like, um, and I think that actually goes back a lot to our conversation around defunding the police or abolition versus reform. It's like, what does that mean to you? Like, what does it really mean to, to love Black people? Like, I'm really, I'm really happy that there were, you know, tens of thousands of people um, at the the uh, the event for uh, Black trans folks, but like sex work is still criminal, and the walking while trans ban is still uh, within the penal law, and forty seven percent of Black women are still incarcerated at some point in their lives, and like, you know, all the hashtags in the world are not going to fix that unless we're organizing around it. And so I like I, I think I'm happy to see that people actually care about this and I'm happy to see that like black liberation is really um, something that I don't want to say people can market because like capitalism gross, but like I, I'm, I'm happy that um, it is it's become like, I guess, mainstream um, as it really should have been before. But I, I think that we always just have to interrogate like what do people mean? Oh, and also quite frankly exploit that from a lot of people too. I mean, I have like, I have white friends that are like, 
oh, hey, how do I be a good ally? And like, they think the way to be a good ally is to like, call me and check in on me. And it's just like, I'm not already exhausted. And what just like, fine, if you're gonna call me, I'm not well, and I'm gonna tell you that. And also you wanna make me feel better? Give money to a black trans woman. Like give money to a sex worker. Um, do this petition. Like, like for real, like that's, I, I think that's how you call people out and you make them like, you, you take them basically like using the movement to like feel better about their whiteness and like you exploit it for something that's good for the community. Like low key, I'll be on a dating app and someone will like talk to me and I'm like, okay, well, will you sign my petition? Like, will you call the governor so that like he, we can get the walking while trans ban repeal? Like will, like, will you give money to a sex worker? You want nudes? Well, show me that you gave money to a sex worker. Like I want proof. So like, yeah, I think that like exploit, cause like that's just gonna happen. Like people exploiting this moment to like commercialize Black Lives Matter, but like you can't prevent that, but you can actually make people, um, you can guilt people into doing shit that's good for the movement. I have a quick follow-up, and this is for anyone, maybe Jared or whoever, it's on this issue, but we were talking a bit about leadership and why Walking While Trans, this is a question from Joey Presley, um, a board member of New Pride Agenda, why Walking While Trans isn't on the table, and part of that is some of the Black legislators think of the Black community and the queer community in silos, and so is, I don't know if you guys have experienced that, but I have a bit, so how do we work towards making that more fluid like the idea that like black people are being served the black community is being served by repealing walking while trans making it explicit for leadership who seems a bit myopic on this issue um unless someone else wanted to talk on this so um i think number well we i think so not everyone on this that's listening right now is black and white folks like i do want you to know that you have a responsibility here too um, in so many queer liberation movements, like black trans women lead and then they get left behind. Um, brown trans women lead and then they get left behind. Uh, I'm thinking about like gender right now. A lot of people like to say that it took 17 years to get gender. No, people are pushing for gender for way more than 17 years. 17 years ago is when, as a movement, like I'm a cis black dude, like we fucked up. Um, when we left trans people behind and said, we got Sonda, we got the sexual orientation, um, like protected non-discrimination act. So like, good luck to you. And it, it, it took almost two decades for trans women. So like, I think that like, um, or trans people in general. So I, I think number one is like, if you are operating from a place of privilege, whether that's because of gender, whether that's because of race, whether that's because uh, you're cis, whether that's because of whatever, is like recognize that you need to clean up your first, you need to clean up your own house and that that onus is on you. Like fixing white supremacy is, it's a white problem. It should be you cleaning up your own house. Um, but how do we like really get in, Answering that question in an in an academically and an and an intellectually honest way, it's a hard it's a hard thing to answer because frankly, like hearing black queer stories and black trans stories is really uncomfortable for people. Um, it, it's really cute to say that like my uncle Bill, um, like out in Long Island or whatever, like he met his partner and they adopted two point five kids and like everything is cute and like I have a rainbow sticker on my on my uh on my car like that's easy to say but to say that like you help liberate you know like a 17 year old black sex worker um who is homeless because they're trans like that's harder that's that's harder to do so i think like how do we make it better we continue to tell the stories um ally, like hope hope that allies help because that really should be on allies to fix their own communities but even if they're not just like tell the stories and if people don't listen to us talk about them we scream them and if they don't listen to us scream it we shout louder mm -hmm. yeah like i j just be being real like you know i've been i'm from brooklyn but i've been in the bronx almost 15 17 years you have to make people have conversations that make them uncomfortable there's no way around it right like and those of us who want to do it and those of us who don't, don't, right? And that's just the reality that we have to, we're never gonna be able to um, get elected officials or religious folks to do that work on their own. We have, to, we have to make the choice 
those of us who want, those of us who live in those communities to really challenge it. Otherwise, it just goes on as normal. It just goes on as like people just being complacent. And it and the reason why people have also moved forward outside of policy is also people fighting in our own neighborhoods and our own hood for, for our survival and for our stories and for our, our, our legacies not to be forgotten and for us not to be discriminated against people in our own communities and not just letting, um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people say this, not all kinfolk or, or not all skin folk or kinfolk, right? I don't, I don't let people who are black just say any type of craziness around me. Anybody who knows me knows that. And that's how I live. You know, I'm not afraid to live the way that I want to live. And I'm also not afraid to fight for my community. And that's the way that it has to be, period. Nice. Um, Lala, did you want to add to that? Or? Um, I don't want to add to that particular point. I was trying to, you know, turn the boat another, the other way that we just <laughs> bypassed the this. Um, but I feel like around the corporations piece, I feel like the lessons learned is um, with pride, white folks were the ones engaging in the conversations and the contracts of those corporations. And so the learning lessons is that black folks need to be in the room, black trans folks need to be in the room, undocumented folks need to be in the room, disabled folks need to be in the room, women need to be in the room to be able to negotiate how that work looks forward. Not it's just a one shot deal, but okay, this is one thing, but here's the plan for the rest of the year. And so I think that's a lesson learned that we didn't monopolize on that. And also to the comment of, um, you know, I think of what needs to be done on the resource, I feel like Again, the pandemic has showed so much what we can do. I think we need to stop always waiting for a law or a system to say, I need this before. Like, we are human to human. We can do things we can do human to human. There are things you can do today to protect the person of the same communi communities we're talking about today in your neighborhood, in your workplace, on your train ride, in your family. Like, there's work, like, up here, that's cute. It's so many, many victories along the way that we bypass because we just, that's all people put in their mind is that takes for change to happen. No, you do that every single day when you engage with somebody. You do that every single day when you wake up and you're a black person. Your duty is to dismantle the messages in your head. If you're a white person, you ain't getting up to talk about how I'm a challenge to white supremacy and how I'm moving in the world and how I'm treating people and I can shift my power, you need to go lay down and try it again. And so I think that for me, yes, in my job, it's a policy framework, but I can't, when I'm off work, it's also my job to do those lower level wins along the way. <laughs> And so I think that's what people forget. Like the work does not stop with that when you go, it's like those lower level wins have to happen if not. And we have to shift the power. We have all this energy of youth and different people that on TV I'm seeing with this energy that before it's not the same old, same old, the people of me and Mustafa's era or me and Jason's era, like there's new people and it's like, who are these people? And so like now that you have them and they're willing to be charged up, what are you doing with their leadership and what are you doing to invest in that? Because I'm 42, I ain't gonna be here that long. And so, like, just the reality of, like, let's move and pivot and shift, like, that's a part of the work as well. So, thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Um, I just want to ask my final questions, and then I'll pass it off to Jason to maybe ask his and wrap up. Um, this is rapid fire, but I guess three things that come to mind. So if we, I know they're like three part question. I'm that person. But, like, if we could make it rapid fire so we could get all of them in. Um, how do we sustain like the youth's involvement civically? Like we hear a lot of talk before this about how like um, the youth just isn't showing up to vote. And I know voting isn't the only way that you yield change, but just as an example. So we're seeing a surge in youth involvement and it's coming because of what they're seeing on the ground. Are there any things that we can do as a community, people who are involved to sustain that for them when they go back to school maybe, when there are other distractions, that's one thing that I'm interested in. Another thing, Lala, you just talked about things you could do on a daily basis to dismantle your own sort of thinking within the lens of white supremacy. Maybe just list a couple examples for people who can who are interested in that sort of work to try to take on a daily basis. And then Jared, you mentioned um, 10 minutes or so ago how bail reform is something you could go on for hours. We don't have an hour, but why is that so crucial? Like, um, if you could explain so succinctly how it's criminalizing the poor um, and just the, the, the sheer number of New Yorkers who are in the criminal justice system are court involved because of their inability to pay off a bail. So I know that's a lot and I'm dumping it all on you guys, but I want to get some good answers before we sign off. And so I don't know who wants to take it away. Maybe we could talk about youth 
first in Mustafa because I know you brought up uh, how there's a lot of energy on the ground and you can take on whatever answer you question you want to but um I'll just be brief and just say you know just really having real conversations with young people you know being honest and listening to them and really dissecting what's happening right now right like you know it's not about getting them to vote but it's it to me it's more about making sure they're involved in the conversation. They have a lot to say. You know, I've said this to folks before, but, you know, think about how COVID landed on them, right? They had to go to school remotely. They've had to, um, then, then New York City put a, all the cities put curfews on them. There's a lot of learning that they're doing right now that maybe adults aren't aware of because they're in their own worlds. And so have a conversation with them. Ask them what they think. Ask them what they think about Oh, looting, you know, like they might actually enlighten some folks who are really, you know, like, oh my God, we can't burn our own community. Well, maybe they've thought about why it happened in a way that can open up dialogue, you know? Lala, do you mind talking just a few examples about that day-to-day -day work that you should be reminding yourself to do? And if you're not, to go back to bed and try again. I mean, well, I could give you an example just right here in the, the comment section. Someone said, I don't believe in legalizing sex work. And so that right there, let's start and unpack that conversation. And so we need, that's, that is also a myth that we've been given to be shameful of our bodies, that it's something that's dirty, that it's something that is wrong. But if we're honest about ourselves, whether we have moved to a different progressive way in life, no matter what we live in the world, we know everyone has benefited from that. And so when you go to strip clubs, when you get a massage, when you're into, when you're going through your porn hub and all those things, you are still engaging that in a way. And if we believe in people having the autonomy over their bodies, then that means people having the right to get, you know, get income off of that because everyone goes to work to what? To earn an income. And so if that person chooses to earn their income in that, that way, then I think it should be safe. I think it should be, um, folks who have these things on their record expunged because it prevents you from even getting in the workplace even if you wanted to get out of it to do something else and i think that we should just really um this is going to let it be what it's going to you know it should be at this point and i think that people have these misconceptions or people just say something that they will not do or have so many um viewpoints about that but you don't ever know what you will do until you are against the wall, you have to survive. You don't know how it is to be a homeless queer person at a young age in these streets. And so it's easy for people to say what they don't want or what they don't like or what they don't engage in without offering a solution that is producing an income and a safe haven for that person that you're pushing judgment on. It was the same thing about marijuana. And so now marijuana is legalized. <laughs> you know, something that was just so simple. And so like sex work is like that next thing. And, that, and it is. And the LGBTQ movement, <laughs> our four founders were sex workers. They took care of half of your ancestors in the village off of sex work. <laughs> I'm a former sex worker. I took care of many children. <laughs> and so, was that, you're gonna say that I was wrong for that? Um, I shouldn't have the autonomy to do that. I've always used my body to give back no matter what it is. And I think that people need to like, just stop those misconceptions of it. And, um, particularly if you're not offering a helpful solution to get people out, it's easier for you to say not to do that or how easy it's to do, your color, your gender, all those things play a part on you navigating further in life. And so we must acknowledge that. And that's all. It's so powerful. I appreciate you just being so frank. Um, and then lastly, Jared, before I pass it off, if you just want to quickly talk about bail reform and just how it speaks to just like the institution of policing being inherently white supremacist. Yeah, uh, real quick, uh, thank you, Lala, for saying that, because I know that t that's like emotional labor and sweat equity. Um, I'm also a former sex worker of all the jobs I've had. It's not, my, not the best, not the worst, somewhere in the middle. I liked it more than working at Subway. I like it more than being a public defender some days. Some days I don't. It's a job. Um, it, it, it's funny. I, I promise I'll be two seconds on this, but they talk about how Marsha P. Johnson threw the first brick at Stonewall. For me, that's not why she's a hero. She's a hero because of Star House, because her and Sylvia Rivera and others, they housed so many queer um, homeless kids and trans homeless kids when they had nowhere else to go. 
Under Penal Law 230.25, she is a felon for doing that. That is a felony. That act of kindness and grace is a felony. And that should not be the case. New York deserves better. Um, and we can't even talk about having anywhere close to an equitable system when we literally criminalize kindness and humanity. Uh, but sorry, that was not your question. Your question was on bail. <laughs> um, so bail, racist as fuck. Um, why is that racist? Well, why do people set bail? People set bail, um, they're, these are people that were never convicted of a crime. They were accused of a crime by a police officer. And when people are, when uh, judges set bail, um, they're supposed to be doing it, like, if the person can pay a certain amount to assure that the person comes back to court. But the reality is, for so many low-income folks, the reason that bail is actually set is to keep them incarcerated, to keep them in bondage, to deprive that person of their freedom when they're still considered legally innocent. Um, the only person, or not guilty, the only person that is accusing this person of being guilty at this point is a cop. The same cops that said just three days ago that someone at Shake Shack like poisoned them and then after a thorough investigation or whatever, they realized that they weren't poisoned. Someone just didn't clean out the milkshake machine well enough. Like these are the same exact cops that, these are the same cops that put the Central Park Five in bondage for all their teens because they did a really shitty job of investigating what happened in, in, in 1995, I believe it was. Um, so that's the problem with bail is that you end up incarcerating people for no reason, but for their poverty. And just to end on this, cause it is pride month and we are talking about black trans women. Leileen Polanco extravaganza, um, would have been 28 years old last week and she should still be with us. And she's not because of our emphatically racist bail system. Uh, bail was recently rolled back by the governor that y'all call the crisis daddy who increased uh, increased jail populations during a pandemic. But under, like, so with the bail reform rollbacks, obviously Laylene was, was uh, not with us by the time that happened. For the first time ever in New York's history, we have made misdemeanors a remand, uh, elig remand eligible offenses. What does that mean? Remand means that there is no amount of bail that the judge can set. That means that you are, are are incarcerated and that is it you're incarcerated until your jail day uh, uh, until your uh until your trial day so for the first time ever we made re uh multiple misdemeanors remand eligible why is that a problem for this community because the reason why people um commit misdemeanors or unlawful acts is because of poverty and if you look at who's the most impoverished black and brown uh black black um queer and trans folks are them black trans folks period are the most impoverished. So if you look at Laylene, like she had a lot of misdemeanors, but why is that? That's because of systems that she lived in. That's because of the criminalization of sex work. That's because the reason why she was actually in is because she allegedly bit a cab driver. If you were a trans woman, the only reason that you were getting close enough to a cab driver to bite him is because he's probably trying to sexually assault you. Um, maybe that's not it. Maybe she was hungry, she wanted a snack. Probably not. He probably tried to sexually assault her. So that is the problem with the rollback to bail. I really wish that everyone started caring about the criminal legal system and making it more equitable like a month before they did so we could have fought the rollbacks. But I'm happy to have you here now, Conrad, and, and, and hopefully uh, we, can, we can be in this fight together. Awesome. Thank you, Jared, for that. Um, Jason, do you want to say a few things before I sign off tonight? I, one, this is an amazing conversation and discussion. Um, I think like we, we, not I think I, we hit a lot of different uh, points and open up a lot of, a lot, lot of thoughts of this. Um, I can talk to you all all night, literally. Mm -hmm. um, but we're going to, I think like it's a good place to like wrap up here. Um, and, and yeah, I just want to thank uh, the amazing panelists for being a part of this. Um, oh, actually let's, let's, if we could just get five minutes. I do think it is a very important conversation to discuss racism within the LGBTQ community. So um, final thoughts around like uh, racism within our community and um, how we can show up both within our community and then also in Black Lives Matter. Intersectionally, of course. Rapid fire, because this, yep. this joint takes off at 8.30. Um, I guess I would say, I mean, I'm going to go, I guess, because I'm, I guess, the person that's really in the intersection of that, right? And so for me, 
I have, I'm blessed to have cousins and uncles and nephews and brothers who um, love, love and affirm me. And every day I understand just like my life is at risk, their life is at risk. And so we have that common understanding. So for me, it's, I can see past that <laughs> sometimes, but there also gets the point where I'm going to be within that space where it's going to stop. It's going to be like, you're not going to be blatantly disrespectful. You're not going to just dismiss that I exist and that I'm impacted by this. And at the same time, I'm trying to liberate you from somebody else who wouldn't liberate me. <laughs> and so like black folks need to ask themselves this question, as horrific as that video was, would you still be upset and enraged if it was somebody who was LGBTQ? And if you can't answer that question and be ready to have that conversation and be real about that, then we have nothing to talk about my brother or my sister. And I'm going to end it at that for me. I think that's that's perfect way to call it. Um, Mustafa, did you want to add to that? Okay, cool. Okay. Um, All right. So, yeah, go ahead, Jason. I'm sorry. No, no, no. The, the, no. Yeah, okay. So I'm, we're just like playing footsie over here, virtual footsie with like getting on. But um, I just, again, want to thank every single one of you guys for not only just sharing your expertise, but also being vulnerable and the labor, the emotional labor that you guys have been willing to just offer us as a point of moving forward. We at the New Pride Agenda are serious about this work. Um, you can ask Jason and the t stuff that we're trying to do is be cutting edge and try to like be a voice and amplify those voices that are in the front lines on the ground. And so um, this video, I should let everyone know, this video is being recorded and we'll post it. There's like usually a 24 hour turnaround where it'll be on YouTube and our website. Um, and then any of the resources that we talked about today, I know a lot of bail reform consortiums were discussed, um, excuse me, bail fund consortiums, um, anything, anything, anything. Um, we'll, I'll make sure to rewatch this and take notes and then post that on our website. But um, it's getting to close to 8.30 and I still haven't eaten dinner. So I just wanna say bye to everyone. Thank you for this good conversation. Um, much love, honestly, much love. I feel like I know you guys a bit, everyone a bit more, even though we haven't met. And so I'm super grateful for how we got connected and I'm also thankful to all the folks who decided to listen today. This is an important conversation and I hope you learned something um, on this Thursday, Thursday evening, mixing up my days, but um, bye guys.